Welcome to Family Church at Home. I'm Victoria. We're excited that you're gathered with us today. Here at Family Church, we wanna welcome you in like family. So if you live in Palm Beach County or the Treasure Coast, come visit one of our neighborhood churches near you. Plan your visit today at gofamilychurch.org. We would love to meet you in person next Sunday. Worship service is about to begin. Our prayer is that you have a great encounter with Jesus today through the songs that we're about to sing and the teaching of God's word. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Jesus, our Lord, amen. Amen, well thank you so much, Pastor Derek. You know, this morning we wanna start by just focusing on the Word of God and reading some scripture together. We're gonna be talking today about uh, surrendering our all to Jesus. And so we want to read from this passage in Romans chapter 12, where Paul tells us to present our bodies as living sacrifices. So why don't we put that up? Let's read it together. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. God wants us to bring our whole bodies, our whole selves, our minds under his dominion and in full surrender. So how about we stand together and let's sing this old hymn. We know this, the words to the song, I Surrender All. So let's sing it together.
Church. Hey there, Family Church. I'm Victoria Rodriguez, and I serve in the student ministry at Family Church Downtown. Are you looking for a way to connect to the family? Well, at the bottom of your listening guide is a connect card. That card is designed for you to let us know that you're here and how we can pray for you this week. Another way to connect is by scanning the QR code on your listening guide to see all the upcoming events. Events like Seven Days of Prayer, beginning on Monday, February 26th at every neighborhood church. Come and be a part of this intentional time of prayer as we gather as a family of believers to lift up each other, our church, and our country to the Lord in prayer. Stay in the know about Kids Camp and Student Camp. Registration is open, and I encourage every parent to prayerfully consider sending their kids and students to camp. We teach the Bible and create an environment where they will hear the gospel and experience a change of pace, a change of place, and a change of heart. You can register your kids and students online for the best summer experience by scanning the QR code on your listening guide. Easter at Family Church is the best time for you to invite your family, friends, neighbors, coworkers to come celebrate with you at our Good Friday and Easter celebrations. Mark your calendars for March 31st and grab some invite cards today to start spreading the word about Easter at Family Church. Church family, summer intern applications are live. We love to invest in the leaders of today. So when you give to Relentless Pursuit, you fund ministry efforts that give college students vocational experience in ministry. Give online at gofamilychurch.org forward slash give or at your neighborhood church to transfer your faith to the next generation. Hey, thanks, Victoria. So glad you guys are all here. My name's Jimmy Scroggins. I'm one of the pastors here at Family Church. If you were here last Sunday, several of you have asked, hey, are you still sick? I'm not sick. So thank you guys for praying for me. In fact, all week long, Kristen, my wife and I, were in Brazil with some missionaries that we support at Family Church. And these missionaries, these families, live out in the wilderness, in the jungle, in the bush in Brazil, and they are literally living alone and in isolated situations so that they can try to reach tribes and people who've never heard about Jesus Christ. And they and their children live out there in very difficult conditions, and they are so grateful to be there. And one of the things that happens when you give to Relentless Pursuit is you are helping to fund these missionaries so we can take the gospel to every language and every tribe and every people group all over the world. And Chris and I had a, a great time with them. And then this morning, we're about to have our Bible study in just a few minutes. And uh, Pastor Jason Smith is going to lead our Bible study. Now, Jason is a friend of ours. He lives in Mississippi, but he's a Florida kid. In fact, he was born right here in South Florida, went to high school here in South Florida. And uh, he is going to come and teach God's word. As we're going through the Gospel of Luke, he's going to continue in that series for us, and you're going to enjoy meeting him, hearing more about his wife and his three children, and I think he's going to talk about his, his dog. So how many dog people we have in the house? Any other dog people? Dog people are, I think dog people have taken over the world, all right? So congratulations, dog people. You win. You, you own everything now. And, and, uh, but Jason's going, to, Jason's going to talk about that, and you're going to be blessed and encouraged by this uh, Bible study. We're about to take up our offering, and while we're taking up the offering, you're gonna hear a very powerful testimony by one of the members of Family Church. Her name is Kenda. And Kenda found herself in some very difficult situations, and it was the kind of thing where she had choices to make. And because of the influence of churches like ours and people who give to ministries like First Care, our pro-life ministry, she made some really good choices, but you're going to be stirred and you're going to be grateful to hear the stories of what God is doing right here um, amongst the members of, of uh, Family Church. So here's what we're going to do uh, while we're watching Kenda's video. We're going to take up our offering. And so if you're sitting all the way on the left-hand side of the pew, that's why it's on this side, there's a black offering bucket. Once you pick it up and pass that across, our ushers are going to come pick that up and uh, we're going to... Uh, Watch this video while while we give. Hi, my name is Kenda Peterson, and my family and I, we worship at Family Church Gardens. I had always gone to church with my family. At that time in my life, I was about 16 years old, and I decided, oh, I got a car, we're going to start hanging out. And so one night, my friends and I decided to go to a party. And at that party, um, 
Everybody left. They knew I was a good Christian girl and, and I had shared my faith with people, but everybody left that party and left me alone with um, a young man. And that night changed the rest of my life because that night, um, without my consent, he kind of forced himself on me. And then I found out two months later I was pregnant. There was a local pregnancy resource center. Um, it's now First Care. At the time, it was called TLC Pregnancy Center. And so I went there and I got some resources and the severity of parenthood kind of hit me and I began to look into adoption. When I had my daughter, um, I went into labor and it was very healthy, healthy labor, very healthy baby. I mean, she was just perfect. And I always wanted a little girl. She was just perfect, absolutely perfect. And I looked at her and I rocked her and I prayed and I said, please God, please, just one reason, one reason for me to keep her that has nothing to do with me. And I just got this peace over me and I realized that she wasn't mine, that she belonged to him. And at that point, I decided that I was gonna place her in the arms of God and that I was going to let her have the life that she deserved. And so I signed the papers. I prayed and I just was real with God. You know, I prayed for her salvation. I prayed for her protection. I prayed for her, her future spouse, her future children. I prayed that she would know she was loved. I prayed constantly for her. I never stopped praying for myself and wanting to have a family. My brother Brad had a struggle with addiction in the last few years, and through that, he could not care for his son. And so I decided to move from Jacksonville back to Palm Beach County and kind of step in with my nephew, Trace. Shortly after me relocating to Palm Beach County, my brother passed and lost his battle with addiction. And so Trace was four, almost five. And overnight, I ended up becoming a mother and he is wonderful. He's a joy. I don't think I've ever been happier. I love being a mom. I love stepping in. I love being able to be there for him. It, it is not a burden. It's not easy. So I don't think any anything God calls us to is always easy, but I love it. I love being a mom. And so I never stopped praying for my daughter and I continue to pray for Trace. The day after Trace's birthday, I happened to go on Facebook and then I saw that I had a message and it was from eight months earlier. It was from my daughter who I'd placed for adoption 30 years before had reached out to me and um, she, everything I prayed for her was as if God went check, check, check. Number one, she's a Christ follower, first and foremost. Um, she married the love of her life, which is great. She's married, she has two children. She's pregnant with a third. She has two boys, she's gonna have a girl. Um, she played piano and the cello. I had prayed for her to like music and be able to have take music lessons. And she thanked me for my sacrifice and hopefully we'll meet soon. And all those questions and all those moments and all those dark times in my life where I questioned and wondered what God was doing, I realized that it was allowing me to go through those situations and those sacrifices so that maybe somebody else would know my story. And so now my life, <laughs> I, I can't explain it. It's just this overwhelming peace, this overwhelming peace that I can look and say that no matter what, He will get me through. He doesn't waste a pain. He doesn't waste a pain. If you allow Him to use it, He doesn't waste it. Man, what a story. What a story of God's just sovereignty over our lives and our situations. How about we stand and we continue in worship through singing this song? Uh, we started learning it last week, but um, let's go ahead and, um, and get this uh, the song. Your name 
is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above the moon. All thoughts and dominion, all powers and positions, your name stands above the moon. And the angels cry. Your name stands 
our suffering. You're above everything. You're sovereign above all things in our lives. Lord, may today we seek to give our lives to you. May we surrender fully to you and your Lordship, oh Jesus. We thank you for this time. Speak to us today, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated, church family. Well, good morning. I'm so, so thankful to be here uh, in beautiful South Florida. I was born in Miami, raised in Hollywood. And so uh, it's just nice to be. I walked to the airport yesterday and somebody threw the U up to me and it just like melted my heart because in Mississippi, they don't do that very much, right? Now, I have two children in Mississippi State. I'll show a picture of my family. So I know it's hard to tell which one's my wife because she is, looks just as young as the girls. But uh, you got my wife, Beth. I think a picture should pop up there at some point. Yeah, uh, got my wife, Beth, here, and she's in the white shirt. And then my oldest daughter, Raina, in the yellow dress. Silas is my son in the light blue shirt. And then Josie is our daughter. My, the two on the ends go to Mississippi State. And so I kind of joke, I traded in one mediocre football team for another mediocre football team. <laughs> But uh, I started my relationship at Mississippi State with very low expectations, so that's a lot different than my, my relationship with Miami. But um, I also want to show you my dog, Wesley, and now why, why this is any adorable. Like, none of you did that noise for my kids. What was up with that? But uh, my dog, Wesley, it's so funny. Uh, now that the kids are off, my wife and I have now figured out uh, how to be parents, right? Uh, we were trying to figure it out while they were in the house. But now that they're all gone, we're, I think we'd be good parents now if they lived in the house. And so Wesley gets all of our parenting. Like he goes everywhere with us and does everything with us. And I'm gonna show his picture towards the end of the message because I really do think uh, it can help you illustrate what, what I really hope God is gonna have you walk away from here today seeing. We're gonna to talk today about surrender. We're continuing on in the series that we're in in the book of Luke, and we're gonna be in Luke chapter 18. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. We're gonna start in verse 15. Um, if you're at home, uh, listen along, go ahead and grab your Bible or grab an app and follow along with me. Starting in verse 15, this is what it says. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to them saying, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all, all these things I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we've left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray over the next few moments that we have together, God, that your word would speak into the deepest parts of our hearts, that you would help us understand what only your spirit can allow us to understand, that you would turn the lights on for some of us who are living in darkness, and God, that you would allow believers to hear this word and for it to challenge them to another step of obedience in their relationship with you. God, this is your word, these are your people, and God, we trust in your power God, thank you for allowing us to be here today. And God, I pray that we'll never be the same because of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I want to draw your attention real quick to some of the background stuff. In, in the story where uh, the, the children are being brought to Jesus, do you notice that Luke uses the word even? Even the babies. They're bringing even the babies. Kind of sets the stage for this concept that in that time, as well as even in this time, babies aren't contributors to society. I mean, they cry, they're distracting, they, they you know, and, and unless they're your kids, you know, there's, there are some cute babies. Can we agree with that? But man, most babies just aren't cute, you know? They go through this massive trauma to be born and then people show the pictures on the internet. I'm like, honey, don't do that. Like, <laughs> like clean it up a little bit. But babies are non-contributing, distracting. But, but um, what, what he says is even the babies are allowed to come. That's what Jesus said. Actually, not just allowed to come, but I want the babies uh, with me. So it should get all of our attention at this concept that these babies who are fully dependent on others. I remember when we had our first child, Raina, we were very young. I was in the military at the time. And I just remember driving around. We, we, would, we had that little thing on her car seat where we had a mirror. So I looked in the mirror and could see her in the mirror. You know what I'm talking about? When she's facing the rear of the car. And I just remember looking back and she's just going everywhere we go. Like she doesn't know where we're going. She doesn't, she doesn't know if we're going to the grocery store or to you know, Walmart or whatever we're doing. She just is just along for the ride. And Jesus says that if you're gonna enter the kingdom, you gotta enter like that. You got to enter dependently, de dependent on someone else, dependent on the spirit, not independent of your own self. But there's another character that enters the story, and, and this character is the ruler, and the ruler is independent. He's powerful. He's the antithesis of the babies. And I think it's interesting as we kind of look at this, this ruler is the type of person that the disciples would have escorted directly to the front. You see, the disciples didn't want the babies around Jesus. Like, don't bother the master with your babies. But the rich young ruler shows up. That's the kind of guy that they would have come right to the front of the line. It's almost like at a club or like a bar downtown. Like, you know, you got those lines of people and they let the elite, the good looking, the young, everyone up to the front. And then everyone just kind of stand in line with all these people. That's kind of how it was. The disciples are like, this guy's going to be perfect for Jesus. Like if this guy came to Jesus, man, he'd change the world. Don't bother him with these babies. But Jesus corrects them. The man comes to Jesus and he asks him, teacher, what must I do? And I just want to stop for a second and say that most world religions ask that question. What do I got to do to get to heaven? What do I got to do to be in good graces with God? What do I have to do? And, and every world religion at some level tries to answer that question. Now, some people, when they look at they say, he says, teacher, and, and, and if you notice, Jesus doesn't answer his question. And some people say, well, it's because he's like disrespectful, but that's not true. Like he calls him rabbi, he calls him teacher, and Jesus is a teacher. And he calls him a good teacher, and Jesus is a good teacher. He's a great teacher, the greatest teacher that's ever lived. But he comes to him and he asks him that question, and, and um, Jesus seizes the moment. This is so important for us to get. Jesus seizes the moment. Because he wants to address a misconception that the guy has. The misconception the guy has is that there's a possibility that you can be good enough to earn entrance into eternal life. And so Jesus wants to take the opportunity as the good teacher to instruct him. And I pray that today, right now, where we are, whether you're here in this room, or you're listening online, that right now in your life, that if there's any pleasantries in your relationship with God, that you got some things right, but you're missing him on other things, that God in his great grace and his love for you would interrupt you today and correct the things that you don't understand. Because that's exactly what he does with this young man. And it's a loving thing to do when Jesus does that. So here's what he does. He says, um, um, Jesus' response to the man's question is not the answer to his question. Instead, Jesus answers the man's question with a question. And he addresses that misconception. He says, why do you call me good? Now, people get confused when they read this. He says, there's only one who's good, and it's God. Well, Jesus is God, so what's he doing? Well, again, focus on the fact that he's trying to get him to focus on the good. What, what makes someone good, and why, how can you be good enough? Because that's the problem with the guy's thinking. 
It is the, if the man is to experience the kingdom, he has to surrender. It's not about how good he is, but he has to surrender. And the same is true for us this morning. You know, surrender is a crazy word. It's a scary word, isn't it? It's a scary word for me if I feel like I have to surrender something. I have to give up. Especially for somebody like the rich young ruler who, like it, it, in that day and time, like if, if DJ Khaled's All I Do Is Win, Win, Win was us out then, like that would have been playing everywhere he walked. And for some of the older people in the room, maybe you don't know that song, but maybe you remember this one. She got the Midas touch. If, you know that song? I sat next to them on a plane one time. It was awesome. But, 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 but for somebody like that, who they, all they do is win in their life. All they do is get escorted to the front of the line. For them to enter into a situation and a circumstance where someone now confronts them on the fact that they might not be good enough and, check it out, they have to surrender. Winners don't surrender. Winners win. But Jesus says you don't win into the kingdom. You have to surrender. Why do you call me good? I love that question. Jesus then goes to five of the Ten Commandments. All the ones that are relating to relationships with other people. And as he goes through those relationships with other people, uh, think of it through the concept of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus took everything and elevated it in the Sermon on the Mount. And so he says, hey, like, here's the things, like, don't, you know, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, you know, uh, don't murder, uh, honor your father and mother. And the guy literally interrupts him. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm good. I, all those, I'm good. See, some people look at it and say, oh, Jesus is saying if you obey the Ten Commandments, you go to heaven. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is bringing up five of the Ten Commandments so the guy can be aware that he does not measure up. In the same way for you, if you came to me and said, hey, am I good enough to get into heaven? And I started walking through the Ten Commandments. The purpose of that wouldn't be so you could prove to me you've obeyed them. The purpose of that would be so you would know that you don't measure up, and neither do I. But the guy has no self-awareness. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I did all that. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. It's like when you're walking in the store and somebody sees you, man, how are you? You might say, I'm good. Well, I say I'm good, but most people correct me and say, it's I'm well, right? Don't be that guy. Like, just don't. But Jesus, thinking about through the Sermon on the Mount, this guy says he's good, but Jesus is like, okay, committing adultery is violated if you even think about somebody lustfully. Murder is violated, even, do not commit murder, is violated even if you hate someone in your heart or you call them a fool. Stealing and lying, this guy is a rich young ruler. I am sure that at some part he became wealthy by taking advantage of other people. I don't know his parents, but come on. It's like one of those little, do you call them gifts or gifs? I don't know, it's up in the air. Young people, what are they called? Okay, they don't know either. Um, <laughs> I love the one of the dog that's like side-eyeing, you know what I mean? This is like when he's like, oh, yeah, I've obeyed to honor my father and mother. Like, come on. If you're a kid, you know, you haven't always done that. If you're a parent, you know, come on. People don't always obey that. Jesus brings us up so he can let the guy know, hey, you're, you're not good, man. This is the most loving thing Jesus can do. Can I say this? If you are here and you're thinking, I'm good. I'm sufficient on my own. The most loving thing Jesus could do, not Jason, but the most loving thing Jesus can do for you today is say, bro, you're not good. Sister, you're not good. And that's what he does with this guy, but the guy doesn't know how to handle it. The man's assumption about goodness and his false sense of security and his own goodness is on clear display in front stage and spotlight. So Jesus keeps him, by, uh, keeps him right in the spotlight by doing something that at this point forces him to go to the end of himself. He believes he can be good enough and so then Jesus knows this. Jesus knows how far that will take him and this is what he says. Okay, fine. If you've done all those things, then take all you possess, sell it to the poor, and then come follow me. Now some people hear this and they're like, whoa, like I, I can't follow Jesus, I don't wanna sell everything I have. You know, Jesus doesn't always ask people to do this. 
We're gonna find out in, in a few weeks when we see Zacchaeus, he doesn't tell Zacchaeus to give anything away. Zacchaeus is the one who says he wants to give it away. Jesus doesn't do this to everybody and he doesn't have to do it to you. He's bringing this up to the guy because the guy thinks he's good enough and when Jesus confronts him that he's not, here's the deal. Jesus says, oh, fine, you think you're good enough? Here's something I know that you won't do. And of course, when he hears this, the man, you know, he goes away sad because he has a lot. Jesus takes him to the end of himself. Jesus confronts him with what he is unwilling to do so he can face the fact that he's not good enough. So here we are in 2024. I pray Jesus does the same thing for you. If you're here in the room and somehow, some way, you believe that your self-righteousness is enough to stand before God, Jesus would say to you, you're not good. If you're a believer in the room today, you might have forgotten that it's not your self-righteousness. It's, it's not the reason that God loves you is because you behave well and you do all the good things. He loves you because that's who he is. It's the most loving thing that Jesus can do for us. So I told you before, we're gonna talk about surrender today. And so what's the first thing? It's this, surrender admits that you're not good enough. Plain and simple. If you're taking notes, that's your first one. Number one, sur surrender admits that you're not good enough. So, um, every once in a while I get an opportunity to go into a hospital with somebody who's like um, got a, like an hour to live and you know it's kind of a humbling situation for sure but this is an illustration I'll do sometimes with people that are really really struggling to get it if they're still awake I write this word down now I don't know if you'll be able to see it but it's the word do D-O I hold up the piece of paper and I say all world religions try to answer this question I already said that before what do I have to do to enter into eternity? What do I have to do to have eternal life? Exact same question the rich young ruler asked Jesus. All world religions try to answer that question. Biblical Christianity is different. It does not answer that question. Instead, it points you to this. It's already been done for you through Jesus. That's it. The basis of your faith is that the work was completed through Jesus Christ, not you. And the story is because Jesus completed the work, you get to experience eternal life, not because of anything that you do. And I think we get that at our moment of surrender when we start following Jesus, but oh man, if you're like me, you forget it, don't you? And very quickly it becomes about the committees you serve on or the, the role that you play or how important you are to the church or what you do in the community. And we start comparing ourselves with each other and judging ourselves by each other and then we feel good and the self-righteousness rises up. So this message is not just for those who are lost, it's also for those who are believers who've lost their way. Come back to the truth of the gospel. God loves you, that's what secures you is the completed work of Jesus on the cross. First Peter 3.18 says this, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit. Titus 3.5 says he saved us not because of righteous things we have done but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. A another one of my favorite passages about this concept of did, what do I have to do comes from Acts chapter two. It's the very first message that Peter preaches after he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you've ever read Acts chapter two, sometimes the people say that like preaching can be judgmental. This is the most judgmental message you've ever heard in your entire life. He literally screaming at them saying, you crucified the son of God. I mean, that's what he's doing, right? But what I love about Acts chapter two is that they don't have an altar call. The people literally are so convicted over their sin, they interrupt Peter in the middle of his message and they say, what shall we do? In other words, enough. I can't take it anymore. I feel so guilty, I feel so ashamed. What do I gotta do? And the answer that most of the world would give in that moment is, well, do good things and stop doing bad things. But that's not what Peter says. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter two, starting in verse 37, says this. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? I've been preaching for 25 years. I've never been interrupted in the middle of a message because someone was so convicted of their sin. They said, I just want the altar call now, never. 
But man, I pray it happens today. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The offer is to everyone who's far off. Come near. We who once were far away, Ephesians 2.13, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. If you're a believer, I pray that that excites you, gets you excited. If you're not a believer, so this is the information you need to work with. Don't delay. Respond now. Repent now. That, repent is a, is a word, another scary word for some people. Because most of the time you only heard it by somebody who's like red in the face, pounding on a pulpit, shouting, repent! <laughs> but repent is an incredible gift from God. It's when your mind and your heart change about your sin and you realize it's, it's, it doesn't get you anywhere. What a gift repentance is. You might be a believer here in the room and you can't remember the last time you repented. I think that is obvious that you were not in a good place in your relationship with Jesus. Every day you wake up, take the opportunity to repent. I loved how the service started where Pastor Derek invited us to get on our knees or to find a place of prayer and just confess our sin before God. But maybe you do need to repent, maybe for the first time in your life. Repentance for a believer is like a gift that takes us back to the beginning, but we don't have to start over. That's what I love. Last night I was with some friends and we went out to eat and on the way we passed a Lake Pavilion, which I didn't know what that was, but they, that's where they got married, all right? And in the car, like I'm sitting in the back, I'm just me, my wife's not with me, so I'm just back there chilling in the back seat. Their, their tone towards each other changed when they passed that place. And Sarah looked at us and said, that's where we got married. And Michael's like, yeah, it was. And then they started holding hands and kissing while they were driving. No, they didn't do that. <laughs> they didn't do that. But the tone changed. Why? Because they were reminded of where it all started. That's what repentance does for us. It reminds us of where it started. We don't have to start all over again. We don't have to get saved all over again. You only get saved once. But, but repentance takes you back to that moment where it all started and it's fresh again. Believer, when's the last time you experienced that? The second thing is this, surrender trust that Jesus is more than enough. Surrender trust that Jesus is more than enough. The first one is, hey, I'm not enough. I, I'm not good enough. The, the second thing is this, surrender trust that Jesus is more than enough. We see it in verse 26 through 27. What Jesus says is what is impossible with man is possible with God. The context is they're saying, well, who can be saved then? If a guy like the rich young ruler who has everything going for him can't get saved, He's not gonna get saved, he'd walked away, then who can be saved? Who can give up enough? Who can sacrifice enough? And Jesus says, with man this is impossible. But with God all things are possible. Jesus is again saying the tone of what allows you and I to enter into eternity? It's not us. The chasm's too far, it's too wide. But Jesus has a plan. We know this because in Acts chapter four, verse 12, in Peter's second message, so his first one, he screamed at everybody and 3,000 people came to Christ. His second message, he screamed at everybody and 2,000 people came to Christ. But in the middle of him screaming in his second message, he says this in Acts chapter four, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. I'm gonna say that one more time and I want you to hear it. If you're listening at home, I want you to hear this. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. That's the name of Jesus. Surrender trust that Jesus is more than enough. So in a moment of uh, conversion, a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, we find ourselves in desperation. 
And we realize we're not enough, but it doesn't end there. It's at that moment then that we trust that he is. Salvation isn't just feeling bad about the fact that you don't measure up. Salvation is when that happens, do you believe that Jesus is enough? Have you forgotten that he's enough? So what that ruler did not have that day, and I want to cut him some slack, right? Because a lot of people are like, man, I can't believe that. This guy got to talk to Jesus. Jesus got to talk to him, and he walked away. You might be like, hey, listen, I've walked away from church a lot, but if Jesus was preaching, I definitely wouldn't walk away. But what this guy didn't have that you and I have is this. That guy didn't have the full story. Jesus hadn't died and rose again yet. So he doesn't fully understand everything. He, Jesus is just a good teacher that he can see. He doesn't know he's the Messiah. He doesn't understand all that. He's heard stories. He's seen miracles. But he, he doesn't know who Jesus really is. You and I now know that Jesus died, was buried on the third day, came alive again, and he's still alive today. And we still choose to try to do it on our own. Now, I don't want to be obnoxious with it, but kind of, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? Like, you and I don't even know what's going to happen in the next five seconds. But then you have Jesus who literally came out of the grave and is still alive today. His heart is beating right now. And he will be alive forevermore. And he now has the opportunity and is offering you the opportunity to believe that he is enough. But many of us still choose ourselves. Our own instincts. Jesus said it this way when he was appeared to to John in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter one. Do not fear, I am the first and the last. I am he who is dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I hold the keys to hell and death. Imagine Jesus saying that to you right now. You're like, man, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust you, Jesus. I I, I, I don't know if I can do that. Believer, you've gotten so casual in your relationship with Jesus. I get so casual in my relationship with Jesus. And I begin to believe it's, it's me who's doing it. It's me who's behaved well. Listen to what he says. Don't be afraid. Trust me. I'm the first and the last. I was dead. I'm alive forevermore. And I'm the one who holds the keys to hell and death. You can trust me. That's Jesus. Do you trust him today? Trust him today. Trust him tomorrow. And trust him forevermore his mercies are new every morning even when we fail so here's what we know about surrender so far surrender admits that you're not good enough surrender trust that Jesus is more than enough and here's the final thing surrender believes that God has something better God has something better In verse 28 through 30, this is what Jesus says to the disciples. Hey, listen, don't worry. If you've given up house or you've given up your, your, you've left your family to follow me, believe me, you will get back more than enough in this life and the life to come. I love what he says there. Some people just say that, well, when I get to heaven. But when does eternal life start? Eternal life doesn't start the day you die and go to heaven. Eternal life starts the moment you trust Christ. John 17, three says this. Now this is eternal life, Jesus speaking that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. When does eternal life start for you? It starts the moment you know Jesus. Surrender believes that God has something better. Now, I'm gonna close in a few moments, but I do want you to think about it this way. For some of you, you are in the same situation as the rich young ruler. Your stuff is what you hold on to. And it's what you're not willing to get, give away. And it's what hinders you from trusting Jesus fully. Now, that's not everybody, but that's some of you. But this lesson is not about money. This lesson is about what takes you to the end of yourself. What's the thing that you won't let go of? We call it an idol. And I don't like the word idol either. That's another scary word. Because I've been places in different parts of the world where you see them worshiping a tree or a doll. And I'm like, I don't do that. I don't have a shrine, but how do I know what an idol is in my life? Well, I maybe ask you a couple questions. The first one is this. What's the thing that you say whenever you sense God bringing it up in your relationship with him that you sense you're saying, no, 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 God, I'm good, I'm good. I'm good, I got this part. You're like the rich and I'm good, I'm good. No, 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 you're, you're not good, Jesus says. 
Maybe another way to ask is this, what is the thing or the things in your life that if God were to take from you, you would stop following him? Those are your idols. And so for some of you, it's not your wealth or your stuff. Maybe you don't have stuff, you don't have wealth, but maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's your career. And when you get to the end of yourself, the question is this, do you really believe you're good enough? Secondly, do you believe that Jesus is enough and more than enough? And here we go. Do we believe that God has something better? I wanna pop back up that picture of Wesley. He's so cute. Wesley loves to play fetch. Now he's a golden doodle, but he's like more golden than anything, right? And he just loves to play fetch. But something about Wesley is he doesn't trust me because there's been plenty of times where I've taken the ball at when he thinks I'm gonna throw it and take it back in the house and he knows he can't play anymore. So what he does is he can't wait to play fetch. He gets the ball in his mouth and he gets so excited to play fetch, but he won't give me the ball. And I'm looking at him and he's looking at me and I'm like, dude, I can't throw you the ball if you don't drop it. And he just looks at me. And he knows what I'm saying, but he doesn't trust that if he drops the ball, I'm gonna pick it up and throw it. But I wanna throw the ball with him. I wanna throw it a thousand times, but he won't let the ball go because he's afraid I won't give it back. And, and sometimes you can see him, he'll fight it, and all of a sudden you'll see it, it'll start to fall out of his mouth, and he'll be like, oh, and he like starts scratching the ground, he gets nervous. He's like, a, it's, you see him warring within himself. And I'll say to him, Wesley, if you just drop the ball, man, I'll throw it to you a thousand times. I'm like, Wesley. God's like, just drop it. I'm like, but I don't think you're gonna give it back. But I'll throw it to you a thousand times. You'll get so tired, I promise. Mm. Is that you today? Is that where you're at in your relationship with God? Trust that whatever it is that you give up, he is gonna give it back. And you don't give to get, but you give because you get to experience faith and without faith, it's impossible to please God. Surrender. Admits that we're not good enough. It trusts that Jesus is more than enough and Jesus and surrender believes that God has something better. He had something better for the disciples and he has something better for you. Would you bow your heads and pray with me now? Father, I pray that over the next few moments as we engage with you, as our spirit engages with you, God, I pray that you would open our hearts and that we, each of us, would have another step of surrender in our lives that we would get off the throne again of our lives and Jesus call you back to your rightful place in charge of every area. And so Lord, I do pray that you'd move during this time and that you'd move as we take the Lord's Supper as a reminder to us that you are more than enough, that your portion is more than enough for us. Thank you for this time to engage with you and engage with your people. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's Jim. Hey, let's thank Jason for that message this morning. Jason, that was so, so good. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, I wrote down all of these notes and all those things, Jason, that you said this morning. I think the thing that kind of got my attention the most is when you said that repentance is that thing that reminds us of how it all started, but then it makes it fresh again. This idea that we can surrender who we are to Christ. And even if you've been a Christian a long time, repentance reminds you of how it all started, but then it makes it fresh again. I hope that's what happens to you every time you come to family church and sing these songs together, watch people baptized in water together every Sunday, open God's word together every Sunday and take the Lord's Supper together every Sunday. We're going to do that 
right now. The Lord's Supper reminds us of how it all started and it makes it fresh again. Now the Lord's Supper is a ritual that Jesus gave us to remind us of his body being broken for us and his blood being shed so that our sins could be taken away. The Lord's Supper is for believers in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're a believer, you should be thinking about taking the Lord's Supper. If you're not a Christian yet, I don't recommend that you take the Lord's Supper. If you're here and you're not a Christian, why don't you just sort of participate and pray and enjoy the moment, but why don't you wait until after you become a believer before you take the Lord's Supper. At Family Church, we also believe and teach it's best if you take the Lord's Supper after you've been baptized and you become a part of a neighborhood church. However, Family Church, we have people here from all over the world every Sunday. If you're a believer in Jesus and you would take the Lord's Supper at your church, then we invite you to take it with us as part of the extended family of Jesus that goes all around the world. But right now, let's reflect Let's think about Christ. Let's remember where it, all, where it all started. Let's think about what Christ has done to free us from our sins. Let's confess our sins to God. Let's draw close to Jesus. And then we'll all eat and drink together in just a minute. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is holy. worshiping with us at Family Church at Home. Right now, all in-person neighborhood churches are about to take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a family meal for those who are baptized believers. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and would like to take the Lord's Supper, please check out a neighborhood church near you by visiting gofamilychurch.org and plan your visit for next Sunday. Join us tomorrow in person for seven days of prayer. Come and have an intentional time of prayer with the family. You're invited to First Connection next Sunday at your neighborhood church. This is a great event to attend to connect with Family Church, and we can't wait to meet you. Have an awesome week, Family Church.